the title of the message today is The God of Providence. The God of Providence. And we're going to pick up really at the end of Exodus 1, where we left off last week. We're going to look at verse 22 to remind us of the context, and then we're going to work through the first part of chapter 2 this morning in our time together. Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, that last verse there says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. So let me just bring us back into the story right here with this verse and kind of remind you what we talked about last week. We're hearing at this point in the book of Exodus the story of what I said was a very cowardly king, the ruler of Egypt, Pharaoh. He has rejected the true God and his ways, and instead of being moved to faith, as Pharaoh has witnessed God blessing his people and fulfilling the promises he had given his people, where they they came into the land as immigrants with 70 people in the family, now they've grown exponentially larger than that, filled the whole region of Goshen. As Pharaoh watches their God bless them, instead of being moved to faith and trust in their God, he becomes fearful of them. He begins to treat them harshly. He hates their God and what is happening with those people. So he starts out, as we talked about last week, he tries to break their spirits with hard labor. He moves to enslave the people. He creates a culture of hatred and fear towards the people of Israel in his own Egyptian people. Creates this racial tension that's going on between them. And when all of those things fail to accomplish his goal of crushing the people, Pharaoh moves deeper into his rebellion against God, his rejection and resentment of God and God's people. And in Pharaoh's depraved sinfulness, he orders infanticide. He tells the midwives, as babies are being born, born, if they're baby boys, I want you to kill them. We'll let the girls live, but kill off all the baby boys. And as we saw last week, the midwives refused to do that. They feared God more than they feared the king, and so they let the boys live. But Pharaoh, even after his plans have been foiled over and over again, he only continues to move deeper into his rejection and his sinfulness. And so now, here in verse 22, where we ended last week, he's called openly for his people, all of his people of Egypt, the citizens of this country. He says, I want you to now become murderers and go kill these baby sons that are born to the people of Israel. Find them, take them from their mothers, throw them into the Nile River so that they die. So we move into chapter 2 with this terrible situation before us. Here's what we read at the start of Exodus chapter 2 this morning, verses 1 to 4. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed him among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now in chapter 1, where we were last week, we said there were some heroic figures and there were some evil figures. The heroic figures were those who opposed the Pharaoh's evil plans. It was the women, the midwives, who feared God more than they feared the king, the earthly king, who could have utterly destroyed them on a whim. But instead of fearing him, ultimately they feared God and wanted to obey him. And so their heroic actions by these women was to defend life and protect these vulnerable ones in defiance of a wicked ruler who had called for an agenda and culture of death in that time. Those women were incredibly brave to do what they had done. And then they were treated kindly, we said, by God, as they obeyed him rather than Pharaoh. The Lord blessed them. He protected them, and he gave them families of their own and caused growth to continue. And so now here we are at the start of Exodus 2, and we're going to see the heroic actions of of two more women, this time a mother and her young daughter, who operate again in defiance of Pharaoh and his wickedness. What we need to understand was that the evilness of Pharaoh in calling for the murder of baby boys was not just happenstance. It was not just a coin toss that happened in the palace. Do we kill off all the girls or do we kill off all the boys? Who's going to live? Who's going to die? Now, unfortunately, this moment in history, like much of history, sadly, believed that males were much more valuable than females were. In fact, females were sometimes treated even lower than livestock were treated at various points in history. Women had almost no rights. They had no legal standing. There was no great things that were expected from women. And that was the reality in Egypt at this time. And that's been the reality for a lot of people who have read these events in Scripture throughout the years 
that followed. So what you see here is the result of a, a sinful perspective on the difference between men and women. And, and men and women are created different, but we are created equal in the image of God. But when that is missed, when that is rejected, sinful and dreadful things like this happen. And here in Egypt, it's boys who are targeted and girls allowed to live because they're not seen to be any type of threat. This type of evil discrimination is horrible, and it didn't just happen in ancient cultures. In fact, we can see the flip side of this, this type of discrimination occurring, how little value was placed on females. When you think about China, I mentioned last week the very evil one-family, one-child policy that was in effect in China for, for quite some time. We know today for certain that it has led directly to the selective murdering of baby girls in China because families wanted sons to carry on the family name. In fact, a major peer-reviewed study that was published shows that in just the 45 years that that policy was implemented in China from 1970 to 2005, in China alone, there were at least 68,400,000 girls murdered through abortion or infanticide just in China alone in the span of 45 years. Their lives were devalued. And the worth that they thought a girl had compared to a boy was seen to be nothing. And so they killed them. Even today, in China, the government now allows families to have two children. But the birth rate in China, if you look at the statistics, is still dramatically skewed towards boys being born rather than girls. More girls are murdered each year in China through abortion than boys are because this culture has been developed in that country and persists to this day. It's horrible and it's evil. And it should grieve you and I as the people of God who understand the value of life, male and female, created in the image of God. And it should move us to some type of response, certainly to prayer to the God who could work in amazing ways to bring this to an end. But despite the gender bias that sinful humanity does struggle with, very much in the days of Egypt here in Exodus, in the first chapter, what we read about were not heroic men who stepped up. Rather, it was clearly the women in that text who were heroic and brave and righteous compared to the epitome of the Egyptian man, the greatest Egyptian man, the Pharaoh himself. He's shown to be nothing more than a rebellious, evil, cowardly enemy of God. And it's the women who are righteous and feared God and worshiped him. <clears throat> And that being the case would have given most readers pause to see something unusual is happening in this story that we're encountering. This is not something that would naturally have developed in stories being told in that era in this way. Something greater is going on here that it's women who can openly defy a king like this. So here we now have this, this famous story before us in Exodus 2. Most of us in this room, we, we probably know this story. We've probably heard it many, many times, perhaps since we were really young. We grew up with this story. But this story should be nonetheless incredible to us, no matter how many times you've heard it in your life. In Exodus 2, 1 to 4 here, we meet a mother. And in this part of the text, we're not even told her name. We do learn it later in the book of Exodus. But here, it's just a mother who has a little baby boy, and she defies an evil king by loving her child and for three months keeping him hidden in secret with her. That, that should be a sentence that strikes you and I. That should be hard to hear, because it's a sad and very tragic thing to have to say. To summarize the story up to this point, what we have is a mother who loving and caring for her baby boy requires secrecy instead of celebration. It requires defiance of a government and ruler instead of receiving blessing and support from the community around her. Just imagine with me for a moment, try to put ourselves into this story, because this is real stories, real lives here. So think with me what this would be like. There has to be such a high level of fear and anxiety, part of the life of that family every single day. I know some mothers were, are more attuned to, to waking up with children. You, you might hear your child cry in the middle of the night, and you just have the, the gift of immediately you're able to, to get up and go to them and, and meet their needs and calm them, and, and tiredness can just kind of fade away. You can care for your child and feed them and keep them from crying, and that's, it's a gift you have. I know some mothers have that more than others, and I know some people, it's a, it's a real challenge. Fathers can be uh, this way, but... By and large, it's moms who, who have this great gift. But imagine for a moment the life of this mother. She doesn't have the luxury of taking a chance in the middle of the night. She has to get up immediately when he cries. 
She has to quiet him. Any cry could alert an Egyptian nearby who may come into her home and with full government sanction, rip her baby boy from her arms and go throw him into the river to murder him. And then likely she and the whole rest of her family would be taken and killed for their treasonous rebellion against the order of the king. So this mother here has taken an incredible step of faith in hiding her son and caring for him for three months. And I know it's a step of great faith because that's not just my opinion. That's what God says it was. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, we read about this as the author reflects. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, I don't think the writer to the Hebrews here means there was no human concern or fear in their lives over the king's edict. It's not that they were casual about this. Oh, I don't care what the king says. I'm doing my own thing. No, they knew the reality was much more serious than that. They don't enjoy the freedoms you and I enjoy. The government's going to take my guns? No way. I'm standing, you know, it's a totally different story when they really are kicking in the doors coming for them. And that's what's, what's happening here. You couldn't be casual about this. But I believe what the writer of the Hebrews is bringing out is what we saw last week too. They feared God more than they feared the king of Egypt. They wanted to worship God more than they were afraid of what the king of Egypt could do to them. Just like the midwives, the fear and worship of God was more central to their lives than the fear of man was. His mother had to have lived in constant concern and stress at what may happen, but she combated that with faith trusting in her God, the true God, in the midst of incredibly dark circumstances, she knew she could rely upon him. And I don't believe, I've read a lot of <clears throat> commentators on this, and, and there's really wide swing of opinions on this. I don't believe at all that it was fear that developed at these three months that caused the parents to shift their plans. Some would, would say it was. I don't think that's the case. I don't think this mother became tired of caring for or protecting her son. The reality of the price that she could pay didn't just suddenly set in at three months. She knew from the day she gave birth what the cost would be if she was discovered. What I think's happened here is simply the natural development of a child. Those of you who are parents or have been around small children, you know. Children develop quickly and change rapidly. And at about three months or so, babies become a lot harder to keep quiet. That's just a natural part of growing up. They cry louder the older they get. They can become fussier the older they get, less comforted. They sleep less the older they get, right? And so what's happened here is not a change in the heart or the love of the parents. It's just the reality that at three months here, the price to be paid is really, it's known, and it's really likely they're going to be discovered. So she's faced with an incredibly difficult decision. How do I best proceed with this boy I love, this boy I've hidden for three months, but now I physically can't. It's not possible anymore. The risk of being caught and him being taken away and murdered grew every single day. And so I believe she acted with faith here in her response just as much as she acted with faith to care for him secretly for those first three months. The mother places this baby boy in a basket. Literally, the Hebrew word that is used here is what should be translated ark. It's the exact same word used to describe the ark that Noah, if you remember that story from Genesis 6 to 8, right? The, the thing he built that provides salvation for his family called an ark. It's the exact same word here. It's used intentionally by the author to describe this basket that she has created for him. And the mother hides her son in this ark, puts him among the reeds in the shallow parts of the Nile River. The same Nile River, the place that Pharaoh intended to be the place of death for all these baby boys, is now going to be used by God for something quite the opposite. For this small little baby boy in this small tiny ark hidden among the reeds. Look at verses 5 to 8 and what happens. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying she took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And so the girl went and called the child's mother. 
I don't know about all of you. I know many of you in this room would share this uh, thought and this feeling with me, but I'm often amazed at the hand of God and his power and his might when I look at the big things of this world. Like it's, to me, it's absolutely breathtaking and humbling to see the grandeur of some of the things that God has put into this world that he has created, especially for me, I love the mountains to put into perspective for me how powerful God is to create such a thing. Maybe for some of you, that's the ocean to stand there and overlook this endless view of the water, and you're amazed at the God who has created all of those things. A few years ago, Molly and I were up in Alaska on one of the trips we've been able to take up there and see friends and fellow ministers. And when we were there this last time, we drove out kind of northeast from Fairbanks to literally the end of this highway. It just goes from Fairbanks out and ends in the middle of the, of the, the wilderness there. And there's a state park that is at the very end of this that uh, has hiking trails and places to climb. It's called Angel Rock. And we went there. We had been there once before when we were um, engaged. And we hiked up to the top on this last trip. And we sat down. I think we got farther than we had gone the, the time before. We sat there looking over this vast view where there's valleys before us and mountains all ahead of us. It was just incredible and breathtaking to just sit and look and to, to think. It caused me to really reflect. The God that created all this was the God who could build not only these amazing, strong, and sturdy mountains, but, but on, the, on the whole of it, just make it so beautiful. And it's one thing to just kind of you know, take some clay and crush it all together and ta-da, made something. You know, it's another thing to craft it, and that's what God has done. With the strength of the mountains, he's built into it all this beauty and all this grandeur that I'm sitting getting to enjoy. I love that. I love looking at the mountains from afar. It's absolutely breathtaking and humbling. But even better to me is when you get to get close to the mountains and realize just how big and magnificent they are. So one of the things we like to do if we can when we're in Alaska is we drive south out of Fairbanks down to Denali National Park. And if you come in from Fairbanks down to Denali, you're coming in on, on a highway. I couldn't tell you which one it is. But the closer you get to the park's entrance and the little town that's built there, you start to go through these deep valleys. And you're, you're driving through. And you're, you're not the bottom of the valley. And you're, you're not at the top of the mountain. You're kind of running through the middle. So if you look out your window, you'll see down the valley to this mighty rushing river that's down hundreds and hundreds of feet below you. And it's incredible to look down. But then at the same time, you can look up. And you can see there's mountains continuing to go up. And you're kind of right in the middle of this, and you realize just how very, very small you are in a moment like that. So humbling to think of the God who has power over all of that, created all of that, controls all of that. The big things that we can experience in this world should humble us and teach us a lot about our God. But I'm equally amazed at God's power and sovereignty over the small things in this world and over the details of life as well. In fact, that's more often what amazes me in my day-to-day -day life. Going to Alaska is great for seeing the big things, but day-to-day, -day, as much as I love it here, we don't have any great mountains to go look at. So I think more about the small things. The biblical view of what we call the doctrine of the providence of God is the belief that God controls and works in all things in such a way as to accomplish his purposes and plans perfectly. So if we rightly believe in this truth about God, that he is the God of providence, that means that God controls the things that happen in this world to accomplish the plans and purposes he has in his mind perfectly as the, the all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And so if we rightly believe in that, it means that we would come back to a story like this in Exodus chapter 2, and we would know that all the circumstances that are happening here are being providentially controlled by God himself. So if we come back to the story, let's look at that for a moment with this view in mind, understanding providence and understanding what's happening here. I think you'll be amazed at the hand of God, just as I am. For three months, this mother that we've read about has been able to nurse and care for her baby boy without detection from any enemy. Not once was a cry overheard. Never was there a surprise inspection, someone coming to the house while she's nursing him and didn't have time to hide him. There was never a slip in a conversation or an offhand comment. We know he has two older siblings. Can you imagine the stress that would be for them not to mention the little baby brother in the home? 
But for three months, she's able to hide him because God's providential hand was upon the situation. And at the three-month mark, she's able to prepare this little basket, this little ark that she makes, and find a hiding place for it among the reeds of the Nile River. And there he's not heard or discovered by any soldier, by any Egyptian citizen, by any traitorous Israelite, and no wildlife comes out. There's crocodiles in the Nile River. None of them go to the ark and attack the baby boy. He's placed there, and he's protected from all discovery and all harm. How does that happen? the hand of God. And then on a specific day, we don't know how many days he was there. Was he taken to the Nile River during the day and brought home for a little bit and then taken back? And is this how they were working for a few days? We, we don't know. The text isn't clear enough. But on a specific day that we know about, a daughter of Pharaoh, a princess of the nation of Egypt, comes down to that particular place to take a bath in the Nile. She didn't have water brought up to the palace, which she could have ordered be done. She didn't go downstream or upstream. She went to this one exact place, and there, hidden among the reeds, was a small floating ark that had the baby in it. And it's her that sees the ark, right? She's with people. There's servants there to take care of her every need. They don't discover the ark. No servant sees it and doesn't want to have the princess distracted and kicks it away or moves it or gets rid of it. No, it's her that sees it, and she orders it brought to her so she herself can open it. And when she, this individual, opens the basket and looks at the baby, she does not immediately obey her father's orders, which she surely knew of. She doesn't take the boy out and drown him. She recognizes that this is a Hebrew child, but she is moved with compassion and a desire not to just ignore what was found, not to put him back and to to pretend that never happened and order silence with the servants. No, she decides to care for this child and adopt this child as her own son. I mean, it had to be her, right? Because no regular citizen could get to do this. You didn't just get to be a citizen of Egypt and find a Hebrew child and go, well, this one was abandoned, but I'll take it in. No, you knew the order. Kill them. If you found the child, you threw it in the Nile. But this one person, this princess of Egypt, only she could do what she did. And only she was the one who found the ark. And then immediately, this young Hebrew girl shows up. We know the sister of the boy. She'd been watching from afar, and she's brave enough in that moment to come and to to offer to the princess, I can find a a wet nurse to care for the baby for you. Likely the princess is is young. At this point, doesn't have children of her own. She can't nurse a child, so she's going to need someone to to help her with that. And the princess, I mean, just think about the moment that, that, that it's in there. She's not only do her servants know what she's found and seen her move to compassion, her intention to adopt this child and take him on her own. They know, but here comes an Israelite slave girl, and she sees. But instead of fear of being discovered and knowing her intent being exposed, she hears the girl out, and she tells her, yes, go. Bring me a nurse. And it didn't have to go that way. It could have, she could have immediately ordered the girl killed because there she is, the princess of Egypt, standing naked in the river to take a bath, and here a slave girl sees her. She could have just ordered it, kill her out of embarrassment. But she didn't. Think about how many thousands, if not millions, of tiny little decisions and tiny little things were happening here that if any of them had gone just a different way, just slightly, it would have prevented this outworking from happening altogether. But they didn't. Why? Not luck. Not chance. Because the hand of God was providentially working out his perfect plan. God was in control of everything. And as we go further into this book, we know the reason was he was bringing a savior to Israel in a way that none of them could have ever expected. But God was in control. This is the incredible, powerful, providential God that we serve. And verses 9 to 10 tell us what happens next. So Pharaoh's daughter said to her, this woman brought to her, we know his mother. Again, what are the chances of that just happening? This is the hand of God. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Moses, as we now learn his name, had been providentially saved by God in an incredible way. Only God could have arranged all of these things to work out the way that they did. And only he could do this, and he did all of this because it was his plan to deliver Israel. This is part, as we have been saying, of a much bigger story. 
But then, as I've said each week, the story of Exodus is not really even about Moses himself. Yes, we learn the incredible story of his birth and his deliverance here. We learned about the midwives in chapter 1, but they're not really the focus of the story. The mother and daughter team, they're not even named here in this part of the text. They're certainly not the focus of the story. The real hero of this story, the real person at work that we should be in awe of is God himself. It's God's power and providence and plan to raise up a Savior for his people. That's the real point of all of these things in the book of Exodus. And looking at the big picture in light of the full story that we have in Scripture, what's incredible to see here is not just all the amazement of the small details that God was sovereignly, providentially in control of, but also to see how he was using this in the big picture of the story that unfolds throughout the entirety of Scripture. God not only does all of this work to save Moses here in this way, he actually chooses to also make Moses a foreshadow of something, someone, even greater. Moses foreshadows God's own coming into the world as the true and perfect Savior of his people. As I said in week one, one of the great things about the book of Exodus that we'll see as we go through this study is how Moses foreshadows the coming of Christ and the personal work of Christ. It starts here. In chapter one, we see a mighty king becomes very fearful of God's plan and people and orders the death of all these baby boys to try and prevent God's plan from unfolding and threatening the king's power and comfort. And many, many years later in Matthew chapter two, another king, one named Herod, hears of the birth of another who would come to be a savior of the Israelite people, and he too becomes fearful and distressed. And Herod first, like Pharaoh, tries a subtle approach. He tries to shrewdly locate the child. He asks the wise men who have proclaimed this child has come to share the location of the child with him. But we read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, who said they would come and tell him, but then didn't, he became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Just as Moses had been born into a dark time where the government leaders were seeking to kill and destroy the lives of baby boys, so too Jesus was born in those circumstances. Just as Moses had been saved from Pharaoh, so too was Jesus saved from the king of his day, Herod. And ironically, Jesus is actually sent to Egypt, the place Moses is saved from. Jesus is sent there for protection. In Matthew 2 there, just before the death order had been given, God warned Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus, with these words, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he, Joseph, rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. So the events of Moses' birth are incredible on their own, but even more so when you understand how they foreshadowed God himself coming into this world and experiencing the same type of things as a baby boy himself. And we see Matthew understands the importance of this connection. He understands the parallel of what we'll get to later in the story of how Moses was led out of Egypt and how Jesus himself was sent to Egypt to be called out in order to fulfill the prophetic word of Hosea 11, 1 specifically. Matthew 2.15 tells us, This, all that had happened, was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. So Moses is going to be important. Yes, we're going to look at the life of Moses. We're going to look at his calling, his ministry. He's an important character in this moment of the story, but he is not the ultimate point of the story. He's a foreshadow of one who's much greater than him, a foreshadow of Jesus Christ himself. Moses is saved. He'll become himself a savior of Israel in this part of the story here, in this part that we're looking at. But Jesus is the true savior of his people. Not just one nation, but all his people from all nations, in all languages, at all times. And Jesus doesn't just save from physical slavery and from evil rulers who have wicked desires. Jesus saves people from their sins and from the captivity and death that comes being part of the kingdom, the domain of darkness that we are all in at birth. Remember, there's no place of neutrality in this universe. We're in God's kingdom, or we are members of the domain of darkness. So as we respond to this powerful moment in the story of Exodus, we should be amazed at the power and the providence of God. 
He's worked in all of these details, these amazing details that had to go into making this story unfold the way it has. Also, he would accomplish his purpose and his plan. It's a testimony to the absolute power and sovereignty of God over all things. And that should speak very, very personally to our lives as well. All the different little things happening in your life are not beyond God's concern or control. He sees you day by day. He knows you, your life, your decisions, the decisions of people around you that affect you. None of it is beyond our God. He's not sitting back going, I just had such high hopes. I wish things would just work out, but man, that's just such a difficult situation. I can't do anything for him. I I feel bad. That's not God. So you and I shouldn't act like it is. It doesn't matter what is going on in your life. If you go to him and ask for him to work, you're never met with the response, I wish I could, buddy. Just can't. No, we have the God who's sovereign over all things, big or small. You can go to him with your needs, with your cares, with your concerns. He hears you and he can work in and through all of those things. Not only should we trust him with the small things, but we should worship him as we step back and we see this grand curvature of the story unfolding and how God intentionally connects events that took place in the life of Moses to events that took place thousands of years later in human history with Jesus himself and what he would experience when he took on flesh and came to this earth. Understand, the same God who is at work at the time of the Exodus and at the time of the birth of Jesus is still at work today. He's no less sovereign. He is no less powerful. He is no less involved in the millions of little decisions and events that are happening today than he was at those times. So like I've said to you so many times before, it's not an accident that you are here right now. But you live today in northeast Missouri or or wherever you may live, and not in Egypt at the time of the exile or the the exodus from Egypt or at the time of the birth of Jesus. The, The fact that you didn't get to witness those things firsthand and you're here today to read about them in the scriptures is not a mistake. It's not just happenstance. This is all by the hand and power and plan of God. And understand, even more than this today, even more than just when you exist in time and where you live in the world, the fact that you are here in this room today, hearing this message, hearing me say to you so clearly that apart from God's grace in your life, you, as all the characters we've looked at here, you're not like the, the heroes of the story. You're like Pharaoh who has in and of yourself, in your nature, a heart that's rebellious against God, that hates his ways and his word. If you are not saved by his grace and being changed by his power, then you're Pharaoh in here. There's no middle ground. You're in the domain of darkness, in rebellion, as an enemy of God. You hearing me tell you that clearly today and hearing me say this good news too, That there's a God who rescues people from the domain of darkness. There's a God who overcomes the depravity of the human heart. There's a God who saves. A God who's more powerful than any earthly king. A God who's more powerful than the millions of choices and free will that's being exerted at any given moment. It's not an accident that you are here today to hear this message. God is working right now to reveal himself more to each one of you. And he's calling each one of us into a deeper response to him, to fear and worship him, not the people or things of this world. To not get carried along, letting our lives go by passively, or to live in fear of the culture or the government or anything else, but to live in worship to him, trusting him day by day. Hear me clearly. Today, I stand here as a messenger of God. The Bible says I'm I'm an ambassador proclaiming God's message to you, making the appeal from God to you today. The one true God who saves all who come to trust in his son, Jesus Christ, the one who was born on this earth, whose life was miraculously saved from evil rulers, whose life was lived in perfect righteousness and sinlessness so that he could die on the cross in the place of his people today, the one who said, it is finished, trust in him, it's all accomplished today, he's calling you to respond to him to give you the gift of salvation from your sins, the God 
of providence that protected Moses and led him into the arms of the exact right person in Egypt, the princess who would be moved with compassion and care and adopt him. That same God of providence has protected your life up to this moment that you are here in this place. He's led you here today so you would come to his arms that will care for you and protect you and love you if you follow him today. God still saves. And today, perhaps you and I hearing this message need to respond to that in a very intentional way. If it's for the first time you're really grasping that, then then the choice, the step that needs to be made is you need to repent of your sins and you need to trust in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done some of us may need to respond by, we, we, we believe in Jesus, we understand that, we, we've put our hope there, but, but you know, we've kind of been living like that's not true in our lives. And maybe we need to come and lay some things down and confess some sins to the Lord today. Maybe we need, we need to repent of being careless in our lives or not being faithful. To have lived our lives like Pharaoh did, to think that we're in control to just give in to our sinful desires, to let fears and rejection of the reality that there is a true God who's in control of all things, maybe that's what we need to repent of today. The good news is that salvation is still available. The God of power is still at work. and we can, You and I can trust in that message and experience him today in a powerful way, just as Moses did as he was delivered from the hand of those who were his enemies there. So right now, let's respond to seeing how the God of providence has worked to bring us here right now and recognize his power and his love, how great that is. And let's commit, let's repent if we need to, or let's resolve to do whatever needs to be done to live now an obedient life to him, to lay down our sins and to find grace and forgiveness and strength in him. Worship team, if you'd come this morning, they're gonna lead us in a final song as I'm gonna challenge you to look at our God the one in control of the big and the small, the one who's here, the one who's still at work in this moment, the one who wants you to respond to him today. Look at him, who he is, what he's done, and don't carelessly let these moments go by. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the message that you have given us through your word. We thank you for the gift that we have of just gathering in this time. Unlike the situation in the time of Egypt, we have no fear of someone bursting through these doors today to carry us off or murder us. And that's a great gift of you because the the wickedness of the human heart that existed in Pharaoh still exists to this day. But we're here because we love you and we desire to worship you and we trust you more than anything else in this world. And so I pray, God, that as we've heard these things, as we've heard the scriptures, as we've had moments to think and hear you speak to us, that that you would move in our hearts right now to cause us to respond. Whether that's coming to the altars, whether that's praying where we are, whether that's going to someone else in this room and asking them to pray with us or, or to get right with them if there's broken relationships, whatever that response needs to be in here today, I pray, Lord, you give us the strength and the courage to do it in these moments as we look to you. We behold our God and we worship him for who he is and what he said. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.